Okay. So this is where in tonight's presentation, I'm going to be talking about 10 tax tips that you, you should be aware of uh, as you prepare your individual tax returns. So to get started, the first absolute essential tip that you need to be aware of is whenever you declare anything on your tax return, make sure you keep the proper documentation to back it up. This is where a lot of people will try to claim expenses, but if you ever get audited and CRA says, well, yeah, we want proof that you paid this, even if you did pay it, if you can't produce a receipt to back it up, they will disallow it. And it could also involve potentially penalties and interest depending on the dollar amount and the severity of the deduction. So you absolutely want to keep track of any documentation you keep during the year. So actually it's a good practice uh, throughout the year as you gather up these receipts, have a special spot where you keep all your tax related documents. So when you do work on your tax return, everything is there. Now, depending on the type of expenses you can claim, yeah, you wanna make sure you keep track of everything. And if you know ahead of time what you can claim, it makes it easier keeping track of the receipts. There is nothing worse than trying to go back and find the receipt from 12 months ago or having to go back to the vendor and trying to ask them if they can give you another receipt. Sometimes they can, a lot of times they can't. Okay, so we'll continue on here. So this is where, when it comes to record keeping, always keep in mind, you have to keep your records for six complete years plus the current tax year. So for right now, we're currently in the tax year 2021. So that means you have to keep your records going back to 2020, 1990, or 2020, 2019, 2018, 2017, 2016, and 2015. I think 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, yeah, 2015. So you have to keep your records from 2015 onwards uh, for this year. Now, one other thing to keep in mind is if you have investments or capital assets like uh, rental properties or equipment, you also have to keep track of the receipts, not from seven years since you bought the item, but seven years from the time that you disposed of it. So if you bought an investment like stocks on the stock exchange and you bought it 15 years ago and you still own that stock, you should still be keeping the documents for the purchase of that stock. Uh, because this is where the seven year requirement doesn't kick in from the time you buy it. It's gonna kick in from the time you actually sell the stock then you have to keep the documents for another six to seven years. I know quite often I get people coming in, they've sold some stock and I ask them, well, what did you pay for it? And they have no idea what the purchase price was because they bought it 20 years ago and they never kept their records. Uh, so that's where we then have the challenge of trying to come up with an estimate of what the cost base of that stock is. Now, one other challenge you got to be aware of when it comes to your documentation is you got to make sure you can read it in the future. And I'm referring specifically to till receipts that you buy, like for meals or gas receipts. It's amazing how blank the receipt can be after three years of sitting in your uh, folders. I actually had one time where I had a client get an audit. He had a lot of meal and trap, a meal and gas expenses, he brought them in and 80% of the receipts we could not read. They were absolutely blank. Um, and this is where CRA doesn't like that. Uh, they do require you to have the documentation. Don't rely on your check statements or credit card statements. CRA does not like those as your supporting evidence because yes, you can prove you bought something at the co-op but they don't know if you bought something at the co-op gas bar or you bought something at the hardware center or the grocery store, or even if you could prove it was a gas bar, 
they have no idea if you actually bought gas or you bought $50 worth of lottery tickets. That's why they want to see the actual receipt. So if you're concerned about the legibility of your receipts after a few years, you can always scan them and keep an electronic copy. There has been court cases where basically judges have ruled that electronic copies of your receipts are fine. Uh, just make sure you have good backups so you don't lose your electronic copies if, if your computer ever crashed. So that's the first step is make sure you keep all your documentation. The next step is something everyone's always paranoid about. It's audits and reviews. This is a fact of life. CRA does audits and reviews every year. Now they might focus on different issues. Like I remember when e-filing first came out, no, this was quite a few years ago. One of the first things they audited was charity receipts and, and medical expenses. Because prior to e-filing, you always had to submit your charity receipts with your tax, with your paper tax return. So this is where during their audit, they found out that a very, very high percentage of taxpayers kind of overclaimed their donations. And I guess the feeling was a lot of people thought, well, I, I never have much donations. I've never been audited. I'm gonna just add a few more dollars of donations, get a little extra tax refund. Well, this is where they found out that some people were, or not just some, but a lot of people were overstating their donations. So they're always doing audits. Some years they might focus on donation receipts. Some years it might be another expense claim they'll focus on. It varies from year to year. Also, they tend to look at your tax returns from year to year or their computers look at them. And they look for big differences where if, if you've always claimed this and all of a sudden no claim, that's where they might ask for some supporting documentation, ask what's, what, what's happening. The key thing to remember is if you follow tip number one, which is basically keep track of all your documentation and assuming that you don't claim anything frivolous or outright disallowed, you don't really need to worry a lot. This is where, yes, as you have the document to back everything you're claiming, if it's a legitimate expense, it should just be a case the auditor looks at it, says, yes, I'm satisfied, and that's it. A lot of, like CRA doesn't actually do a lot of full scale audits anymore, like they used to in the past. Quite often, they just do a random review where they're going to ask, send you a letter saying, well, we're looking at this line number, like maybe charitable donations. Please send us a copy of all your receipts for this year. They just look at it. If it matches up with what you claim, you're done. That's it. So you don't need to really worry about a full-scale audit. Usually they, that tends to be business owners, and quite often it's business owners where they have a lot of questions. They feel that maybe they're hiding a lot of income or not declaring all their income. So this is where the best thing is don't panic. Just read the letter closely, see what they want and provide them with the documentation. And hopefully it'll get settled quickly. Now, as a side note, occasionally you get some auditors that are very nitpicky or they're just having a bad day when they work on your file and they disallow a lot of things. This is where keep in mind, they do not have the final say. You do have the right to appeal their decision. Uh, a lot of times, sometimes if they disallow it, it's because you didn't quite send them the right documentation. And it might be just a case of resending them what they want. Um, if it's a case where you just have a very argumentative auditor and you feel you're right, you do have 90 days from the assess reassessment to appeal their decision and it goes to a different department. 
And often they look at it with a fresh set of eyes. And if it is a case where the auditor has made an error or was probably too harsh, they will overturn it. Uh, the problem though, it may take a year or two for that to get settled, depending on how backlogged they are. And with COVID this last year, CRA has been getting backlogged in some of their uh, activities. So again, this is where don't be scared of audits and reviews. So Brian, we have a question here. Um, yeah. From uh, September 2019 to April the 20, uh, 2020, I pay a home uh, daycare monthly fee for carrying my child. She told me that the tax receipts would be issued after year end uh, until I left her in uh, April uh, 2020. Uh, she owed me the tax receipts of, uh, of the year 2019 and the year 2020. Can I claim the daycare fee without her receipts? Uh, since I have a record of uh, e-transfer each month, I pay her. Yes, this is, this is kind of a, a tricky situation. Normally, CRA would want her to be issuing, issuing you a receipt. But if it's a case where she just doesn't want to issue the receipt, and unfortunately, this does happen, uh, you, you do get contractors who are trying to kind of work under the table, which basically means they're trying to avoid declaring their income to CRA. And they think by not issuing any kind of receipt or paperwork, they're okay. Uh, it kind of puts you in a bind. This is where the best advice I can give in this case is as long as you did pay these receipts and they were for childcare, you can claim them. Just keep in mind, if you ever get requested for a review, that's where uh, you may have to uh, give a good story to CRA saying why you don't have a receipt. So I would then recommend keeping track of every detail of information that you can track of in your own notes. Keep track of the name of the person, their address, their phone number, uh, whatever details you have on them. They're supposed to provide you with your social, their social insurance number. But if they're not providing you with the receipt, they're probably not going to provide you with their social insurance number. So in that case, make sure you keep track of any bank documents uh, or cancel checks that you can show that you did pay it. I'm not guaranteeing, guaranteeing that CRA will accept it without question. They may have lots of questions. But if you can explain this, why you don't have a receipt and it's because of their unwillingness to give you one, this is where CRA, they may accept the expense, but it's probably a good chance you know where they're, they're gonna go next. They're probably gonna check, check up on them. And that's actually how they find a lot of people who are cheating on their taxes. They don't find it by going to their tax return directly they find it when they're auditing someone else's tax return and they find some of these discrepancies. Um, like another area that you may come across, contractors. Like the con construction industry is just notorious for uh, the black market where basically they're working under the table and not reporting their income. Well, that's where quite often they're gonna say, okay, I'm willing to do this work but I want to be paid in cash, no receipts given. Well, as soon as they say those words, you know automatically they're not going to be reporting their income. They're trying to hide it. And if it's something that you can deduct on your tax return, this is where you need that receipt to back it up. And like in construction, for example, Saskatchewan has a home renovation tax credit that you'll be able to start claiming on next year's tax return. And you are going to need receipts to back it up. And if you hire a contractor that doesn't give you a receipt, well, you either got a, you're taking a big chance or they're going to just basically disallow the expense. So you do got to be careful. Um, and all I can say is just be aware if you get people who don't want to issue receipts, it's likely because they're trying to avoid CRA 
and you have to use your judgment uh, whether you find someone else or or stick with the situation and just keep good notes yourself. Okay, the next question. Can we buy or claim a credit for buying a car, servicing a car and fueling during the tax return? Um, again, this is, I'm mainly focusing on individual tax tips. Usually most individuals do not have the ability to claim car expenses. The only exception is if it's for employment use and you've got your employer to fill out the appropriate form indicating that you are required to claim, use your car for employment. Maybe you got paid a reasonable car allowance and that's where you can uh, possibly claim your car. If you're in business, yes, you can also claim your car for business, but that's gonna be a discussion for the next uh, topic, which I believe is in the first week of April. And Tim can correct me uh, at, at the end of the presentation. And I'll be talking a lot about deductions. My 10th tax tip is talking heavily on deductions that you're allowed to claim. So I'm just gonna move on here. So the next tip, this is where you should always get in the habit of filing a return. Even if you have no income, you still should be looking at filing a return in most cases. Now you might say, why? I have no income, I have no tax. Well, part of the reason is Canada uses your net income on, that's on your tax return as the basis for determining quite a few of your tax social benefits. Things like child tax benefit, your personal GST credit, old age security, uh, guaranteed income supplement. These are all social benefits that they calculate based on the net income on your tax return. Even if your net income, in, income is zero, you still need to know that. And if you're married, especially, a lot of the family social benefits, like child tax benefit especially, you only qualify if both spouses have filed their tax return because they'll use combined net family income. Like quite often during the summer, they usually recalculate the benefit amount on July 1st. Usually on July 21st, like July 20th is the day they usually pay out the first uh, benefit payment. July 21st, we get quite a few phone calls saying, I didn't get my benefit. And most cases we narrow it down. The one spouse is working, the other spouse is just stay at home, no income. They thought, well, why should I pay for a tax return for my spouse who's not working? Well, it's because they need to get their return in to qualify for child tax benefit, not just the spouse who's working. Uh, other things are carry forward credits. Even though you may not use them next year, they get carried forward to future years. So you could use them when, in another year when you do have the opportunity. This includes RSP contribution room, which is based on your employment income or earned income. It can include tuition amounts that you may pay while you're going to university. You have no income, so you say, I might not need it. But when you do start earning income, it's nice to have all those tuition credits built up. Then all of a sudden in your first year or two of income, you're not paying much tax in those years. So it's always a good idea to file a return, even if you have low or no income and you're not paying any tax. Uh, there's also several credits available that you can get even if you have zero income. Uh, for example, the, um, the carbon tax credit or the, the, what are they called? The environmental climate incentive credit. You get that back whether you have income, paying income tax or not. So you could have zero income if you're single, zero income, uh, and, you, and you're over 18, get your tax return in. You automatically get the carbon tax credit. Uh, there used to be some other non-refundable credits like for children activities, but they don't have those anymore. So there are credits out there that you could take advantage of and you actually get a refund back. But again, you have to file a tax return. There's also a low income working tax credit. Again, you have to have 
uh, a minimum amount of income, like about $3,500 of employment income. But once you do, even though you're not paying any tax, this is where there's a work, working income tax credit and you can get that back as a refund. So there are advantages to filing a tax return. And tip number four, when you do file your tax return, try to file it on time and pay your outstanding taxes. If you don't feel like paying penalties or interest, the deadline for most individuals is April 30th. You have to have your tax return filed and, and the um, taxes paid by April 30th. If you're self-employed or if your spouse is self-employed, you then have a deadline of June 15th to file without a penalty. However, to avoid interest charges, you still have to have your outstanding taxes paid by April 30th. Also, in prior years, if you if you had to pay more than three thousand dollars in taxes on your tax return, you you likely will be asked to pay quarterly installments. Now, this is where when you get a letter saying you got to start paying these quarterly installments, if you do not pay them, and the following year you still owe three thousand dollars or more in taxes you will be paying interest, not from April 30th, but from the date they requested the installment to be paid. Uh, you do have to pay interest on, the, on that amount. So you gotta be careful of that. Basically CRA wants you to prepay uh, your income taxes for the year, just as if you were working uh, for someone, you get your taxes deducted off your paycheck. They just, they don't want people owing a large amount of money because they do have problems collecting with some of them. Uh, and the penalties for late filing, for the first time you're late filing is 5% plus 1% per month that you were late. So it can add up fairly quickly. And this is based on income taxes only. And the interest is approximately five to 6% depending what the current interest rate is. Now, Something else to keep in mind though, is make sure you remember to report all your income when you do file your return, because they have a, another penalty. If you get caught twice within three years, not reporting all your income, like you keep forgetting a T5 slip or a T3 slip, the first time you might have to pay a penalty based on the extra taxes. But the second time, they assess you a 10% penalty based on the actual amount of income you forgot to declare. So it, you could be a situation where normally you don't owe taxes, but if you forget twice in the last three years to report a, an income, you could get hit with a, like a 10 or even as high as 20% penalty, both federally and provincially um, for not reporting that income slip. So again, you wanna be careful that you report all your income. Okay, well, I'm just gonna stop here. I'm gonna look at the chat and see if there's any questions. And if you have any, just please type them into the chat box. And it looks like we do have a few questions. Um, okay, for 2020, people can claim working from home tax credit. Uh, do I need to deduct vacation days, et cetera? Uh, no, I believe you just have to report the number of days you're working at home and they're giving you a $2 per day cal calculation. And the advantage of that is it's a nice, simple calculation. It's not a large amount. Uh, this is where there is another option. You can actually, if you normally work out of your home, you can get your employer to fill out a declaration of employment conditions and you could possibly qualify for more but I know a lot of employers are refusing to complete that form because there's a lot of paperwork and uncertainty on their behalf. So this is where you just gotta keep track of the number of days that you were required to work out of your home. And you just take a flat $2 per day and you don't need receipts for that. So it, I don't think you'll see CRA auditing that one too much because there's literally millions of people that this is gonna impact. Um, next question, I'm taking a U of R course as an adult, but not a full-time student. 
can I claim the tuition and or cost of the books? And the answer to the books is simple. No, you, no, no one can write off books, even full-time students. There used to be a education and textbook amount, which was a flat monthly amount, but both the federal and provincial governments got rid of that deduction. So the only thing left is you can claim tuition on your federal tax return, but you need to get a receipt from the university. And I know with the University of Regina and SIAS, or, or, or called SAS Polytech now, they don't mail out the receipts. You have to go online into your student account and download it, which it should be available by now. Usually they wait till the end of the month, end of February to have them available. You just got to download it. And normally the other requirement is it has to be a post-secondary institution, which U of R is, and it has to be $100 or more. So if your course is more than $100, odds are you should have a T2201 receipt uh, that you can download from your university student account. And if you don't have a student account, you may need to phone up the university to find out how to access it. Uh, can I claim my online classes on LinkedIn, Udemy as educational expenses? And in that case, not likely because they're not really a registered post-secondary institution. Um, they're not even Canadian. Uh, so you probably would have a tough time claiming that as a personal deduction. Now, if you have a business uh, that you, that, and these courses are related to your business, that's a different story. Um, they can be deductible. But just as a straight personal deduction, my initial thoughts would be you probably would have a tough time claiming them. Okay, back to the previous question. Uh, for RSP contributed in January to February 2021, and I claimed them in 21 and not 20. And to do that, to, okay. Yeah, with what RSP receipts, they're one of the few exceptions where they're not quickly, strictly based on the calendar year. Uh, you have 60 days from the end of the uh, previous fiscal year to contribute to an RSP and they allow you to claim it on the uh, previous year's tax return, even though you may have made the contribution in January or February. Now, usually what CRA prefers you to do is they want you to declare those receipts uh, on your tax return for the previous tax year. So for example, right now we're doing 2020 taxes. If you made a contribution in the last two months, they want you to report it, but you don't actually have to claim all your RSP contributions. Like usually there is a spot on the RSP worksheet form where you can say, um, I know I contributed $2,000, but I only want to deduct $1,000 this year. And the, the other $1,000 will get carried forward to a future year as an undeducted contribution, which you can use in a future year. Um, I know with their like, software, this is where if you don't claim it, you could claim it directly in your 2021 form, but you gotta be careful how you enter it in your tax software because they usually make a distinction is this a receipt that you already uh, reported in 2020, you just didn't claim it? Or is it a receipt that you never claimed on your 2020 return at all? You never reported it. Um, yes, it gets a little, a little bit more trickier, but it is possible. Okay, now, can you claim tuition regardless of the income you make? Um, again, the answer is yes. Like this is where a lot of students, they have no income when they're going to university. So that's where they, you can claim the tuition and it'll just get built up. And actually in the case of tuition, um, if your, your parents may have the ability to claim the first $5,000 of tuition on their tax return, and then you claim the rest as a student on yours and it gets carried forward to the future if you can't use them. And that's one reason why you want to file a tax return, even if you have no income, is make sure that the government knows about your tuition receipts. 
because in Saskatchewan, we also have this graduate retention benefit where you could get up to $20,000 back as a tax credit against Saskatchewan taxes. And it makes it a lot easier if you already reported your tuition on your tax returns in the previous years. Um, next question, uh, do we need to file tax for the tip received? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, this is where in Canada, you need, we, we basically have what's called a self-reporting system. Even though, yes, the government knows a lot of what we're doing, like through T4s and T5s and everything else, we are required to self-report any income that we earn. And especially this is more like for the self-employed people who are people who are part-time contractors or might run a part-time business, you are required to report all your income. And this also applies to restaurant owners, or not restaurant owners, restaurant employees. Um, and this is where something that, that's been circulating for years is a belief that all you need to do is just report 10% of your income and CRA will be happy with that as tips. This is where, no, that there's nothing in the tax code or in CRA's policies that says you only need to report just 10% of your gross income from your job as a restaurant server. Uh, a couple of years ago, they actually did a, a, an audit uh, basically, they do some case studies. In this case, they actually did an audit of numerous restaurants in Ontario with the sole purpose of determining how widespread is the lack of reporting tips. And essentially, they found out that the vast majority of the restaurant servers were not properly reporting their tips. And like, I think it was in the range of 80 to 90 percent. So this is where whether what they do with this in the future, they might they try might try to make it stricter, uh, or they might require the restaurant owner to tell you what tips are received. But normally you do have to report them. Uh, can you claim donations to charities outside of Canada? Uh, typically, the answer is no. It usually has to be a Canadian charity. Um, in the case of the U.S., so. If you have US source income, they do allow you to deduct some US source charity donations against that US income that you report on your tax return. But normally it has to be a Canadian based charity uh, and there has to be a registered charity number on that slip. It should be a nine digit number followed by RR then a four digit number like 0001. And uh, charities is one area where they are clamping down on. There has been a lot of abuse and scams around donate, charitable donations. And if you make a large contribution all of a sudden, be prepared to provide your receipts. You will likely get a letter during the summer asking you to provide proof of all your charitable donations. Because that is an area that they review quite often. So another tip. When it comes to investing, this is where, again, you can save some taxes depending on how you invest. Um, there are some tax efficient investments out there. Now, keep in mind, I'm just talking strictly from a tax point of view. Whenever you get into an investment advice, you have to look at your risks tolerance. And that's different for everybody. Some investments, while they may be great for tax purposes, may not be ideal for you because of your situation or your risk tolerance. So keep in mind, this is just strictly talking from a pure tax point of view. If you buy investments that generate capital gains, that's where those capital gains are only 50% taxable. Like you only have to pay regular tax on half the income. And the other advantage is as that investment's growing in value, you don't pay tax on it until you actually sell it. So this is where you're not just getting a preferred tax rate, but you're also getting a deferral of taxes. So like a few common examples is buying and uh, buying stocks, for example. That's where you could buy a stock, hold on to it for 30 years, 
and you don't pay any tax on it unless it issues you dividends, which you then have to declare tax on that in that year you received it. But on the actual stock itself, no tax until you actually sell it. So hopefully it's growing in value and it's compounding faster. Um, also, like if you buy rental properties, you buy a rental house to rent out. Well, again, as long as you own that house, it could be going up in value, but you don't have to pay tax on it until you actually sell it. Uh, dividend income. This, again, this is usually income from stocks. You don't pay the full tax on dividend income like you do on interest income. Interest income, you pay the full tax rate. Dividends, you're usually paying somewhere in between the capital gains rate and the uh, regular tax rates. And that's because when you get a dividend from a company, that company has already paid tax within the company on that income. And a dividend is a company after tax income. So essentially the government's trying to compensate or try to minimize double taxation by estimating what taxes the company's already paid and giving you that tax break. So that's why dividend income can be preferred. Another type of investment structure is tax-free savings accounts. Now you don't get a deduction up front like you do with an RSP, but the money grows tax-free and you can take the money out anytime and it's not taxable at all when you take the money out. In the case of RSPs and, and some other registered plans, yes, you may be able to get a tax deduction up front, but you'd still get the deferred tax growth, but they're a lot of times they're fully taxable when you take the money out. So that's where you gotta be careful with RSPs is how you time it. Um, I come across people who hate RSPs with a passion. In most cases, it's usually because they misused it. They probably contributed to the RSP when they were in the low tax brackets, and then they took a large lump sum out when they were in the higher tax bracket and paid a fortune in taxes. Um, you wanna to try to contribute to your RSP when you're in a higher tax bracket, like when you have more income and you try to withdraw from your RSP in years where you have a lower income and you're in the lower tax brackets. Also another little hint with RSPs, you can over contribute by $2,000 without penalty. And that $2,000 can stay in the RSP account growing tax free. Just be careful you don't over contribute anymore after that, because if you over contribute, it's a 1% per month penalty uh, for that over contribution. And then finally, there are, depending on the, on the year, there are usually special investment incentives the government will have. Like for example, labor inv investment funds, like both the provincial and federal government will give a special tax credit over and above uh, what the benefits you, you already get for regular investments. Or there were flow through shares for oil and gas and mineral uh, development, where you essentially got to write off the full amount the first year as a deduction. And then when you sold it, eventually it came, you were taxed as capital gains. Again, with all these investments, this is just the tax from a tax point of view. Just make sure you have to look at your own circumstances before you start implementing some of this. And then tip number six is income splitting strategies. Now, this is an area where the government has been attacking. Like you may have recalled two or three years ago, uh, for about six or eight months, there was a lot of news about the government making changes to corporations' tax laws. And a lot of it had to do with income splitting. They were trying to prevent the uh, corporate business owner from being able to split income with their family members in an improper way. So this is where they, and there actually used to be a, a split income option for regular families, but that was taken away when they enhanced the child tax benefit. But the purpose of income splitting is to spread their, your taxable income across as many family members as possible, especially your spouse, to reduce your average tax rate that you're paying on. Now, even though many of the strategies have been eliminated, there's still some in place. 
like for example, for seniors, you can elect to have your can to pe can the pension payments split equally between you and your spouse. Or on your tax return, there's still the pension income splitting where you can split your income between spouses. Uh, especially if it's the case where you have one spouse who worked all their lives and they have a high pension income and the other spouse has minimal income. It's amazing. You can save thousands of dollars by taking advantage of pension income splitting. Another feature that you can do, use, especially if you know, like when you retire, you know one of you will have a high income, the other one will have a low income. You can make contributions to a spousal RSP where you can deduct it off your income, which is theoretically the higher income and get the higher tax rate savings. But the money would be put into an RSP under your spouse's name. And when they retire and pull out the money, it's taxed under their name, not yours. So it's a way of indirect income splitting. And then finally, if you're self-employed, you could look at paying wages to family members. You just need to make sure they are doing the work and you're paying them a fair salary. I see there's a few more questions here. Uh, the first question, RSP lifelong learning plan. I plan to withdraw for an RSP for a lifelong learning plan in years two and three. If I withdraw in May 22, I believe you just need to show you were a full-time student that year. I don't think it's a specific like January to December. Like you, you would get a slip that says you had so many months of full-time students. And by the way, the lifelong learning plan, this is one of two options you have to take money out of an RSP without being taxed immediately on it. Uh, the lifelong learning plans allows you to take up to two $10,000 installments to go towards paying for post-secondary education. And then after you're done schooling, you have to pay it back over 10 years. And the other one is a home buyer's plan where again, you can uh, take out a lump sum amount of money uh, to go towards buying your first time house. And then you have 15 years to pay back your RSP. Yeah, and in, in the case of that $2,000 RSP over contribution, you do not need to pay it back. You can keep it in your RSP forever. Just remember though, if you make any other over contributions, you could run the risk of triggering that 1% per month penalty on anything that you over contributed by $2,000. The first $2,000, there is no penalty on it. Okay, the tax-free savings account. Yes, uh, it is tax-free, even if you use the funds to buy a GIC. Uh, any income that you earn within a tax-free savings account is non-taxable. The only thing, caveat I'm going to say, though, if you're a day trader, like for buying and selling stocks on a daily basis, sometimes you come across day traders who say, well, I'm, I'm putting my money into a TFSA and then I'm going to day trade using my TFSA money. You need to be careful in that case because this is where the technicality of the tax law comes in. There's different types of income. And in a TFSA income, it's only property income, which is actual investment income. If you're a day trader, that's where you run the risk of being classified as a business. And that income could be classified as business income, which in that case, business income is not compatible with a TFSA. And you could face the 1% uh, per month penalty in addition to having all that business income being taxed as ordinary income. So you do gotta be careful about that. Okay, there's no further questions. So I'll just move on here to tip number seven. And we actually kind of talked about this one already, is working from home. Uh, yes, this is where you are required to work from home. You just usually have to declare the number of days that you were impacted by this and it's $2 per day, no receipts necessary. Now, there is another option, like especially if you are normally required to work from home, you probably had to do this anyway is you just get a form called T2200 from your employer completed. And it's a declarations of employment. 
And basically the employer just indicates, okay, these are the expenses you're, you are required to pay for and you're not reimbursed. Um, this uh, again, um, whatever the employer is comfortable with saying that you're allowed to claim, it could include vehicle expenses, cell phones, working from home. Um, there's different types of expenses that you may be required to pay. And that's where you do need to keep track of all your receipts. Like, uh, like in the case of a regular employee, you're allowed to declare your utilities, um, uh, more of the operating costs of maintaining your home. Um, if you're in self-employed, you're actually allowed to claim more, including your mortgage interest and property taxes. Uh, but there's a kind of a scale of what expenses you can claim. There's uh, employ working as a strictly employee, there's a commissioned employee, and then there's self-employed. And as you go from the employee to the self-employed, you're allowed to claim more expenses. A lot of employers don't want to go through the hassle of creating a 20, the T2200 form for hundreds of employees. And then another common one is medical expenses. This is where uh, there's a lot of confusion about medical expenses. And one of the first things is, first of all, you can only claim medical expenses that exceeds the 3% of your net income. So if you only have $200 of medical receipts and your net income is 60,000, that's where the first $2,000 of your net income you can't write off that anyway. So in that case, there's really not much benefit to keeping track of your medical expenses. You just don't have enough. But remember, this is where you can claim medical expenses for you and your dependent children under either one of your spouse. So as long as the lower income spouse is paying taxes, usually it's to your benefit to have them claim the medical expense because then they don't get hit with with this 3% clawback on as high of income. Also, there's a lot of medical expenses that you can claim. If you go to the CRA website and take a look under eligible medical expenses, you're gonna see pages and pages of medical expenses. So you may wanna take some time to look at it. Um, like for example, if you have to say, go to Saskatoon for a doctor's appointment, you can claim the mileage and meals to go to Saskatoon and back as a medical expense. This is where you should be keeping track of the date and time of your appointment and who you saw and the purpose. But as long as you have a legitimate medical appointment and you had to travel more than 40 kilometers, you can claim it as a medical expense trip. And they have, every year they set the mileage rates and meal allowance rates that you can claim. Also, if you're infir infirmed or disabled, that's where you may be able to claim attendant care expenses, especially if you're living in a nursing home or a, an assisted living home. This can add up to a sizable deduction if you qualify for this. And another feature that a lot of people don't realize is you don't have to claim medical expenses on a calendar year basis. You, you're allowed to claim any medical expense in a 12 month period that ends in the current tax year. So this is where if you, if you can do some pre, uh, pre ahead planning, like for example, say um, your kids have to get uh, braces and they're starting in November and, is, and you've got $10,000 of dental work uh, from November to March. This is where you can say, well, you know, I can have the option. I'm not gonna claim my medical expenses for November onwards. I'm gonna save them until the next year. And you just claim on the next year's return a period from November 1st to October 31st of the following year. And then you can group all those expenses into one year. And that's where all of a sudden you may greatly exceed your 3% threshold and be able to claim a much larger portion of that medical expense. So this is where you can do some forward tax planning because 
you can't on the previous year re return say in the return that you're claiming from January 1st to December 31st. And then on the following year say, oh, I'm going to claim from November 30th of the previous year to October 31st. They're kind of overlapping the claim periods. So, uh, so those are a couple of expenses that you can claim. The disability credit. This is something that a lot of people don't realize that they can claim. Now, depending on your, your health, if there are certain things that you can't do for yourself, things like feeding yourself, walking, getting dressed, going to the washroom, uh, blindness, for example, this is where you may be able to qualify for the disability tax credit. And it's amazing what are some of the symptoms that you can have that allows you to qualify. And they can lead to a tax savings of about $2,000 per year. But in addition, if you qualify, it makes it a lot easier to qualify for a lot more medical expenses, like the attendant care expense, for example. Uh, depending on the disability, there's also a disability savings program. It's like another registered investment savings program that's available. Now, this is where in order to qualify for this, you have to get your doctor to complete what's called a T2201 form. It's a disability tax credit. And it's, it looks like an intimidating form. It's about 10 or 12 pages. But just keep in mind, you only have to fill out the first page and they only have to fill out the section that applies to you. Like that form basically covers every possible ailment out there. And the doctor just goes through the sections and says, oh yeah, uh, here's the section on blindness. And they just report uh, some basic information about your, your medical condition and when, it took, and when it started occurring. You submit it to CRA. And if they approve it, they'll come back, say, yes, we approve it. Uh, we, we're going to approve it starting in this year. And if you've had that condition for several years, you just didn't know about this form, they will backdate it. And they will allow you to readjust your tax returns for all the previous years that you were eligible for this disability credit. They may also give you a certain time period, like especially for young adults that they think you might improve. They might say, well, we approve this credit for five years. After five years, you have to requalify again, just in case your health improves. But this is something you definitely uh, should look at if you have some medical conditions. Now, one thing I'll, I'll just mention, this is where on, on the internet, you'll come across a lot of ads that says, uh, we'll, we'll apply for this disability credit for X number of dollars. You don't really need to rely on them. This is where all you need to do is get your hands on the T2201 form. And this is where all you have to do is just Google on the internet, type in T2201 space CRA. It'll come up with a printable document. Just take it to the doctor that's best aware of your situation. You may need to ask them a couple of times. Some doctors don't like filling out these forms. They don't like paperwork. Um, but once you get the doctor to fill it out, you just submit it to CRA. And I believe it's a Winnipeg address you have to send it to. And that's it. You just make sure on the first box, it says, well, who's going to be the one claiming the credit? Who's the one that has the disability? Um, like if it's a child, this is where the parent could say, well, I'll be the one claiming it. And all you have to do is at the bottom of the form, there's a box you can check off that says, if this credit is backdated, do you, do you want us to automatically adjust your forms? Just say yes to that box. And if you qualify, say for the last 10 years, and I've had people get 10 years of qualification, they will go back and adjust your returns for the last 10 years automatically. Um, you don't need an outside agency to do this for you. So just be aware of that. I, I know it's like with this credit, especially, I see a lot of companies saying, well, come to us, you will help you qualify for this. And really all they're doing is just filling out this form and that's it. You don't need their help to do that. Okay, I've got a question about TFSA. Yes, you can invest in stocks. 
just as long as you're not classified as a day trader. And usually the, the big difference is how much time and effort you put into it. Like if you're a day trader, it's quite often they're buying and selling stock all day long. That's likely going to be a day trader. A long-term investor, they're usually buying stock and then the, they hold on to it for months or even years at a time. That's perfectly allowed in the TFSA as well as an RSP account. You have the same issue with an RSP uh, with day trading, where if it's classified as a business, it's an el ineligible investment. Okay, next question. Can you claim medical expense mileage always or does it fall under 3%? Well, that's where, whether you claim the medical expense mileage, it's just added with all your other medical expenses you're claiming. And if the total of all your expenses are still under 3% of your net income, you won't be able to claim anything. You can only claim the total medical expense that exceeds 3% of your net income. And actually there is a dollar limit. Like if you earn 200,000, they're not going to say, well, you have to have six or two hundred six thousand dollars in medical expense. There is a limit. It's around two thousand dollars that they cut off the uh, the limit. So basically, all the various tax credits and deductions you might you want to take a look at, and I'm just going to go through a lot of these. And so a couple of these are actually fairly new as well. First of all, if you have children. Um, and you have to pay for childcare expenses. Uh, usually the lower income spouse is allowed to make a claim. Um, again, this is where you need to make sure you have receipts for this. Um, moving expenses. If you had to move uh, to be more than 40 kilometers closer to your workplace, you're allowed to claim moving expenses. And this includes like real estate fees to sell your old home and utility disconnection fees and the cost of moving vans and such. Um, you're allowed to claim that. And you can only claim the, those expenses against income that you earn uh, from the new job. And you do have two years to be able to claim these moving expenses. If you happen to live in the Northern Canada, the remote areas, there's a Northern living allowance. Just be careful. Um, a lot of people might commute, like they might live in Regina along with their families and they just travel say up to Fort McMurray every two weeks. They go up there, work for 10 days, come back for a week, then go back for two weeks. Usually that doesn't qualify you for the Northern Living Allowance. You basically have to be living there full time. Um, if you have student loans, and these are government student loans, um, you're allowed to claim the interest on those student loans. And also if you have loans for non-registered investments, i.e. not TFSAs or RSPs or RESPs, um, or if you have a business or you have rental property loans where the, you use the money uh, for those purposes, you can claim the interest on those investments. Um, charitable donations, we kind of talked about that already uh, you can write off donations, but there's also special rates. Normally with the majority of these deductions, you only save at the 26% tax rate, which is the low tax rate, so that everyone gets the same benefits. But in the case of charitable donations, you only get a 26% rate on the first $200. After that, anything you contribute is at the highest tax rate which is in the 40%, or 40, like the 40s percent range. This is where, even though you're in the low tax bracket, you could get a large incentive uh, or tax credit from making large donation receipts. Um, if you happen to be a teacher and you pay for uh, personal, um, like you pay personally for edu education supplies that you're not reimbursed for, you can claim $1,000 and get a federal tax credit against that. If you purchase a home for the first time, again, there's both a federal and a Saskatchewan tax credit available. Um, with the Saskatchewan renovation credit, this is a new one. And a lot, I'm tax season started, I'm getting people coming in 
I've already had people coming in with receipts trying to claim for renovations that they paid for in 2020. Unfortunately, with this program, you can't start, you can't claim those receipts. It's from October 1st of 2020 to December 31st of 2021. They have to be claimed on next year's tax return. And then anything you buy in 2022 is declared on your 2022 tax return. And the limits are, I believe it's 11th, the first thousand dollars you can't claim, but uh, the next 11,000 you can claim on your 2021. And for the 2022 year, it's only uh, after the first thousand, but up to 10,000 or a total of $9,000 of expenses. So make sure you keep your receipts for any renov renovations you do to your principal residence. Uh, you may you may be able to declare that. If you belong, if you have to pay professional fees, like you're a doctor or nurse, or you're, you're part of a union, those are deductible expenses. Uh, employment expenses I touched on in the previous slide, but some people are normally working out of their home all year round anyway, besides COVID. Usually you do need a T2200. If you do try to declare employment expenses, and you don't have that T2200, if you get reviewed and you just send them your receipts without this form, there's a good chance CRA will disallow everything until you can provide that form. Uh, tuition expenses I referred to, that's where you can, uh, usually it's tuition above $100 from a post-secondary institution. And they typically will give you a T2201 form and the new program that was introduced last year is called the Canada Training Credit. This is where everyone's getting, uh, oh, there's an income range. I, f I forget, I think it's something like 11,000 to 60,000 or something like that. Don't quote me on the income range, but they're getting $250 credited to a training account. And then if you take post-secondary courses they'll actually refund, they'll give this money out as a credit uh, to go against tu the tuition that you paid. So this is something fairly new that you wanna keep in mind. Now, in addition, these are all like specific deductions. In addition, there's a lot of other standard deductions that everyone's automatically allowed. Everyone gets a personal exemption of, a, it's, I believe it's approximately $12,000. If you're working, like you have employment income, there's an employment credit of just over $1,000. If you have a spouse who has no income, you could claim essentially the, uh, the spousal amount. It could be up to $12,000, but they deduct whatever income she earns off that. Um, if you're a single parent, there is an equivalent of spouse amount that you can claim. Um, if you're over the age of 65, there's an age credit amount that you can claim. Um, there's quite there's quite a few other credits available uh, that I haven't mentioned. Um, oh, okay, got a question about personal tax credit. Uh, say a person earning 50,000 income and the personal tax is $10,000, is the taxable amount equal to $40,000? And for the majority of these credits I just talked about, these are called non-refundable tax credits. They do not come off your top level income. They actually, uh, they take, they add up your total credits and they take a percentage, usually 26%. So everyone gets the same benefit. The only exception is donations. That's where if you contribute more than $200, you actually get to save at the higher tax rate. Now there's another type of item called tax deductions. And if I go back one slide, this is where things like childcare expenses, moving expenses, Northern living allowance, the interest, these are tax deductions. And where the distinction comes in is these are deducted off your highest dollar of income. So if you're in the high tax bracket, and you earn, you have these type of deductions, you basically get to uh, save at whatever your highest higher tax rate is. 
So there is a difference between a deduction and a credit. Would a patch on the roof be eligible? Um, I believe it is depending on the dollar amount. Uh, that's where, again, you keep in mind the first thousand dollars you can't deduct, but anything over, if you had to make repairs to your house, um, that would likely be qualified. Um, uh, there is a long list of eligible renovations uh, that you can refer to. And I believe a furnace, replacing the furnace also counts as a eligible expense under this program. If I didn't claim the new home purchase in that year, because you didn't know the credit, can I use it the next year? Um, the Well, there's kind of two parts. The answer is no, you cannot claim it the following year but you can go back to the year that you should have claimed it and make an adjustment to your tax return that year. So that's what I would recommend is just do the adjustment for the year you should have claimed it. And then they'll likely want copies of the documentation showing that you bought the new home. The, the risky run is if you try claiming it in a different year, that's where if they ask for your documents, they could look at it and say, oh, wrong year, we're disallowing it. And they don't ask the question, well, should you have claimed it another year and offer to do that for you? You have to do it yourself. Next question. I received in the mail a T5 slip, and I'm assuming this is for my TFSA account. Why wouldn't I, why would I get this form? Box 13 says interest from Canadian sources. Um, well, first of all, this isn't a dumb question, so you can ignore that last part that he has mentioned. But this is where it's not a TFSA. You would not get a T5 slip for a TFSA account, or you also would not get a T5 or T3 slip for a TFSA account or an RSP account. If it's source interest from a Canadian source, what it could be is, it could be interest that was generated on your bank savings accounts. Uh, because like that's where, if you have a, a savings account where you earn interest, banks may, may report the interest on it if it's a certain amount. So it is income that, if it's on a T5 slip, you do have to report that as income. Okay, so what determines the different tax brackets? And that's all based on your in, the amount of income. Now, just this is just rough numbers, approximate numbers. On the first $45,000 of income, that's roughly the 26% tax bracket. On the next 45,000, that's roughly 33.5%. On 90,000 up to about, I believe it's 125 or so in that range. That's the 40% from 125 to 200, that's 44%. And from greater than 200, you're looking at roughly 48%. Now I might be off by half a percent. They keep adjusting the rates and the brackets, but that's approximate. And the other thing to remember is if say your income is around 45,000 and then you cash in $5,000 of RSP that puts you into the next bracket, you do not pay the 33.5% tax rate on the entire $50,000. You only pay 26% on the first 45 and you only pay the higher tax rate on any of the income that's in that bracket only. Okay, in terms of the donations, this is where again, the first $200 you would save at 26%. Uh, Anything over $200, you start saving at the higher tax rate. Uh, so it's definitely, even though you're not in that bracket, you, you would save at the highest tax rate. So it, it's definitely an incentive for people to donate. Okay, another one about the home buyer. If I'm a first time home buyer, but it's the second house for my spouse, can I claim the first time home buyer credit? Without knowing all the details, my initial response is not likely. Because one of the requirements is it has to be a first time home buyer for both you and your spouse. Uh, so if your spouse has been living in a house uh, and it was their principal residence, you likely wouldn't qualify 
for the home buyer credit for the second house. But as with a lot of these specialty deductions, you have to look at your actual details or your case facts and compare it with the eligibility requirements and make sure that you do qualify or not qualify. Don't take my word for it, just kind of based on some general details because there are some specific requirements you have to meet. Okay, for the Saskatchewan home renovation credit I referred to, it's a new program. It's a savings on Saskatchewan taxes, but it started in October, but you cannot claim the October to December of 2020 receipts in 2020 on your tax return. You have to save them for the 2021 tax return where you would be claiming those 2020 receipts plus all the 2021 receipts. And it's from anything between over the first thousand up to $12,000 of expenses. So it's a total of $11,000 of possible expenses. And that's per family, not per taxpayer or per spouse. It's per household. Okay, I've got a question about conference fees or professional education costs. Again, from an individual, um, from an individual point of view, which is what tonight's presentation is about, in order to claim those type of costs, you need to have a declaration of employment form. And your employer typically has to say, you're required to attend these conferences and you have to, uh, and you're not reimbursed for them. If you're in business for yourself, it's a lot easier claiming those type of fees if it's related for business. This is where as an individual, you don't get to claim a lot of excess deductions. Um, being an individual, unless it's one of these special deductions or credits, there's very little else that you can deduct. Like actually one tip, if you want to save some more tax, start up a business and you may be able to start claiming expenses as long as you can just justify there for business use, you may be able to claim expenses that you normally just incur for personal items only that are not deductible. You may be able to start claiming them as a business expense and start saving some taxes. You just got to be careful though, because if you're just doing it just for the sake of creating tax write-offs, CRA could challenge it. If it's association fees that required um, to maintain your certification, yes, you can typically claim them. Like, um, like for example, if you're a, a nurse and you have to pay your nursing fees every year to maintain your nursing certification. Uh, yes, those are deductible. But if it's just a membership and it's a voluntary membership, it's not mandatory. Yeah, then typically you can't deduct those. Um, and yeah, if you're looking at starting up a business, technically you don't have to register as a formal business with corporations branch. But where you do have to register is if you intend to advertise yourself under a business name, then you do have to register with corporations branch in order to make sure you're not having a, a incompatible name or a name that's taken by someone else. Um, in the case of a rental property, a rental property is not business income, but it is classified as rental income, and that can lead to some other deductions you can claim. But again, there, there's a different set of criteria for what you can deduct for your business versus what you can deduct for a rental property. But that's subject for another seminar, which Tim does actually get me to do uh, occasional seminar talking about rental properties and taxes and, and running a business and taxes.